Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. Uh, this gospel lesson causes a great deal of discomfort for those of us who sit in long robes in the premier seats of the sanctuary and live in a tradition in which we say long prayers. I just want to say that up front, and then we can not talk about that anymore, please. <laughs> really, this, uh, this reading is an uncomfortable reading when we get beyond the part that seems sweet to us, and that's how I took it with me this past Sunday. I usually start reading the upcoming Sunday's readings as soon as I leave church the last uh, Sunday. So last Sunday, I left. I was on my way to Atlanta for an Ignatian retreat, a silent Jesuit retreat. I'll talk more about that in a second. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to go up there. I'm going to have a couple of days of silence. I'm going to find that beautiful spiritual gift that this thing has to offer me. But I was uncomfortable because what is happening in this reading is Jesus is taking to task the religious institution that provides not help to this widow, but instead devours her last two coins. There's a, it's an uncomfortable sermon in there that I'm not going to preach today. <laughs> um, and I was struggling with that. Russ, what in the world? What grace will I find there? Part of the struggle for me is definitely related to the fact that I truly believe that you and I will never have any idea what it is to live in the shoes, should she have even had shoes, of this marginalized poor widow in first century Palestine. We can't know what it is to live in first century Palestine, much less to be in her place. You and I will probably never know poverty like that. You and I will probably never know what it is to be marginalized in that way, to be that desperate and hopeless. So it's hard for me to read this reading and, and find a place where I can see myself or even be encouraged by her. That's how I went into my retreat on Sunday. I had the great benefit of having lost my voice at church last Sunday. Uh, so my first couple of days of silence were wonderful. And, uh, and then ironically, I got my voice back on like Tuesday, uh, which is really unfortunate when you're in a silent retreat. <laughs> um, what, um, what I found on Monday on retreat was that uh, this, is, this was a retreat designed for people who have done these kinds of retreats before. So we didn't have a lot of assignments. It was go, and you know what to do. Just go do it. Pray, be silent, come back and talk to me tomorrow for an hour, and then I'll send you off for another 24 hours. This is my spiritual director talking to me. So on Monday, I went off to pray. To say those prayers that I say so often, to have some sort of conversation with God that I thought I might draw closer to in the silence than I normally do. And what I found, which I will tell you because I know that others of you have experienced this before, is that as I said my prayers that Monday, it was as if I was speaking only to myself. There was no recipient to my prayer. I felt no closeness to God whatsoever. It's a challenging place to be for any of us. Uh, it's a daunting place to be as a pastor. I wandered the grounds of this retreat center hoping to find God in some hollowed out tree somewhere or the spider making its web uh, prior to the rainstorm. I hoped for a lot of things. And at some point I became kind of desperate. I had gone down to the river, this retreat center is right along the Chattahoochee. There was kind of a mist along the river. It was a, a bit foggy even. <clears throat> uh, sat there and I audibly said through my raspy voice, all right, God, time to show up. <laughs> I flew here. I took Marta after I got here. I could have taken Uber to get here. But no, I thought I was going to save the church a dime or two. And I took Marta. If I can take Marta, you can come down from your heavenly throne. <laughs> and you can just be here for a second. And there was silence. The gurgling of water. I put my head down and stared at my shoes for a moment, tucked away in the leaves that had already blown off the trees. And then suddenly I heard the sound of these two blue herons coming in. Now, some of you have already romanticized this moment. You're like, oh, the lovely sound of herons. <laughs> Not so much. Herons are a foul-sounding creature. 
It sounds something to the effect of, uh, I, I liken it to an elephant with some sort of sinus infection that is perhaps undergoing a surgery in that moment. It's not the place where I saw God, all right? Don't jump to conclusions. It is the thing that pulled my head up <laughs> to look at what weird Star Wars creature was coming up the river. But when I looked up, I saw across the river a tree that I had not noticed yet. All the trees, truly, their leaves had already changed colors, and a lot of the leaves had fallen off the trees. There was one tree. that It's like it had just found out that it was fall. Its leaves were bright yellow and red. It was glowing. It was amazing. And yet my sense of desperation had not waned at all because it was on the other side of this river. The cold water moving too fast, too deep for me to get there. I still felt so disconnected from what was for me in that moment some sort of representation of God trying to reach out to me. So that is the short way that I tried to explain to my spiritual director that afternoon where I am right now. And not actually right now, where I was back then. I think a lot has happened in the last week. She was kind and she was gentle. She knew that I am the type of person who wants to do a retreat right. <laughs> what are my assignments? Set me up. I'm going to start checking boxes as soon as you say go. Life is going to be good. And I'm an advanced student, so if you will skip chapter one and chapter two, please, uh, I'll go ahead and get on to chapter three. Maybe we can finish this book by the end of the week. And she quickly said, <clears throat> Remington, it sounds to me like you've forgotten the first principle and foundation of spirituality. And I have. The first principle, and this is the correct way of talking about it from an Ignatian standpoint, uh, the first principle and foundation, and here's like, this is a paraphrase. You are deeply loved and cherished by God. You, plural, sure, you individually, absolutely, you are. God loves you and cherishes you, not because of what you've done, actually in spite of the things that you have done, God loved you with that love before you were born. God constantly holds you in that love. That's the principle of the whole thing. The foundation then becomes that God has created all of this stuff around you to try to tell you how much God loves you. And all God really asks of you is to use yourself, your life, and everything around you to try to say back to God, I love you too. That's it. It's not that complicated. It's awfully challenging, isn't it? It wasn't exactly the balm I was looking for, but it was the homework assignment that I needed. For whatever else I had been doing in my life, especially over the last six months or so, that felt so holy and righteous and good, as if I were being such a great pastor, disconnected from that first principle and that foundation of what it is to be a created and cherished child of God, not much good was going to come out of it. That sense of disconnection, the inability to even experience the gift that God was trying to give me in my natural surroundings was symptomatic of the fact that my foundation was crumbling. My plea with God to show up was my last ditch, desperate attempt to try to make a connection. The rest of the week went really well, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to talk about it because it's really not about me. What I found out in that moment instead was maybe I do have something in common with this widow. I will never know what it is to be as poor or marginalized as she is. I will never know what her actions would look like in a literal reality, but I sure know what it felt like in a spiritual reality. And I've felt it before, and I know many of you have as well. Life can be that way sometimes that robs us of some sort of 
sense of spiritual well-being such that it almost feels like we don't have two spiritual coins to rub together. And the last thing we have to offer back to God is just the prayer, you better show up now. I know you well enough to know you've been there too. I've watched and held your hands as some of you have been there. I've seen you hold one another's hands as some of you have been there. Some of you are there even now, and today is your last ditch attempt to show up, and maybe God will show up too. For all of the things we talk about with church, for all the things we could be as an institution or as a community, sometimes we make it so complicated. Sometimes we rush ahead to chapter three. Sometimes we forget the principle and the foundation of the whole thing. And in doing so, we begin to build this house on shaky ground. It's one thing to say it intellectually, to give our assent to the notion that God cherishes you, that God loves you so deeply, and that all you ever have to do is use what is within your grasp to try to say I love you back. Another thing to let that sink into your heart and be incorporated into your lives. But you know that already. That's, I think, why in part we come back and we come back and we come back. Because it's hard work, but it's holy work. And we know what it feels like when we really believe it. This fall, we have talked a lot about Sabbath. <clears throat> we have talked about the work of Sabbath, what to do. We have talked about that, how that fits in as part of this puzzle that we call discipleship, what it means for us to follow Christ and Christ's love. How it sets the stage for us to be ones who worship God in the beauty of holiness, ones who study the things of God, not so that we can learn about them, but so that we can learn from them. To be ones who pray together and live in fellowship with one another, to have a holy community. To be ones who give and give from our abundance and not from our leftovers. To be ones who serve one another, our community and the world in God's name. That's chapter three. That's all the stuff that extends from our understanding of how loved and cherished we are. That's a way, perhaps, of saying I love you back. But it's the complicated version. The simple version starts with your heart today. Just trying to say I love you back. I love you too. In my family, we've tried Sabbath, and we've tried Sabbath, and we've tried Sabbath, and we've tried to work at it, and try to work at it, and try to work at it, and sometimes it's been great, and sometimes it's not. A lot of times it hasn't been holy because we haven't rested on the foundation of God's love. We've been at it for 60 days now as a church. It ought to be a habit now. We've been at this Christianity thing for a couple thousand years. You would think this would be a habit now, too. things of God are challenging. For however complicated we might want to make them, they are as simple as knowing that God loves you. And that all you are, all you ever have been, all you ever will be, all that you will ever touch or that will be in your life touching you, is an opportunity to say I love you back. Don't take for granted this day or the next day, or the next breath, as an opportunity to tell God that you love God, or to take the opportunity to listen to God say how deeply God loves you. Don't wait again until you only have two coins spiritually to rub together. Let it be now, and let it be always.